Today we're going to do part two of the Outward Mindset, this interview I did with a friend of mine, and we're talking about it, but let's first remember why it's so important, because naturally we're focused on ourselves, our own survival, our own metrics and goals, and this blinds us to what other people's goals and metrics are, and it focuses us on the wrong things. We are selfishly focused naturally, but that doesn't sell. Curiosity, empathy, listening, being caring and respectful. This is what other people want to hear, want to sense from us to build trust. Because trust is the bandwidth of communication. Without trust, we don't believe the other person. The other person doesn't believe us. So the words that we use are uh, discounted. They're not valued. They're not appreciated. They're not believed. So we have to build up that trust. And to do that is showing caring and respect for the other person, interest in them. Not, Not so much overtly, but intrinsically. And how do we build up this outward mindset? First, we have to be aware of it. Second, we have to be conscious of demonstrating it, of practicing it, of thinking like the other person. And when I I talk to somebody who's really struggling in sales, this is typically what pops up as what's in the way. They can't understand why what they're doing isn't working. And it's not so much about IQ, and people call it, you know, emotional intelligence, and it's closer to that, but I think it's even deeper than that. Uh, Emotional intelligence kind of touches on empathy, but it doesn't touch on curiosity and interest and listening skills and respect for the other person and trust. All of those things are much more advanced skills that we only learn after a lot of trial and error. Why don't we skip that and just believe in it? Believe in it because the opposite we know doesn't work. So it must work. Let's get into the interview. Let me just first ask you, how many cold meetings are you getting per week? Meetings not from inbound leads or existing customers, uh, but meetings with the people that you want to meet with who don't know who you are yet, don't know your company, don't know what you do and the problems that you solve and how you can help them. The most common answer I get is one. <laughs> and I don't mean to laugh at it. I mean to, that that's probably the key thing that's in your way. If you could uh, 10x that, 20x that, you know, good 5, 10, 20 great conversations per week, They're not all going to be interested, not all going to be qualified, but you have to start where the other person is and build them towards you where you want them to be. This is a skill. It's not a knowledge. A lot of you could take the test and pass it, but you're still not accomplishing it. You have to be able to develop it as a skill. And that's what you get out of start the conversation, get the meeting. Uh, This week, I recorded a frequently asked questions video that's both in uh, the link in the show notes, learn how to read the show notes, as well as my YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube. Just search for it. It's the, uh, the first video that you see right there on the homepage of the YouTube channel. It's also at the website. Uh, b2brevenue.com you'll see a little frequently asked questions video link right above let's chat button i still take the chats uh the 15 minute chats i do them uh the challenge is that the time availability has been diminished so the wait is a little bit longer but so the time waits for nobody now is the time to take action on these courses to get those conversations started so that you can crush your number the rest of the year. So go to B2B Revenue right now and check out that video or go to the YouTube channel and see it. Here we go. Is this, is this related to the mammal to mammal selling that you're always talking about? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, how, how does, how does mammal to mammal selling differentiate from people to people selling? Well, people don't think they react. Okay. I mean, look at all the social discourse. Is this thinking or reacting? 
right? The crowd think, you know, all this, whatever pops into their head, their emotional response, you know, on both sides. It makes no sense. In two cases, one was about sleeping in a parking lot. The other is about, you know, $20 of cigarettes. Is that worth any of this? It escalates. People react. No one's thinking. If you were thinking, like, run home, go away. <laughs> you know, it's like, sure. Right? <laughs> but we're so, mammals. We, uh, we are it's, mammals. It, it's funny. A dog ownership teaches you this. Like, they have the same emotional circuitry that we do. And obviously, like, you know, monkeys and stuff do. But you, when you own a dog, you can see them. They just, they react. Like, they, they react with emotion. And it's the they same do. emotions that we have. They are. And we, we, can choose, we can choose to only act on those emotions or we can cho- choose to think things through. But. Right. I mean, we, we do have a prefrontal cortex, but you've got to understand that's 5% of our brain power. So it's 5% against 95. Guess who wins? Mm-hmm. Right. Does anybody not know how to lose weight? So, so you're saying the mammal side, the instinct side, and the reactive side, that's the 95. And the, the 5% is, the, is the, the, the thought part, the logic part. Yes. Is, is EI or instincts involved in one but not the other? Or does it, does it touch both to some degree? Absolutely. Right? You never wake up at 3 in the morning going, I hope I have some leftover kale shake in the fridge. Right? <laughs> You wake up and you go, I bet there's some of that pizza, that lasagna, that chocolate cake, something sweet and savory and salty, mm-hmm. right? EQ and outward mindset is 100% prefrontal cortex. That's why it's so hard. It takes conscious effort, repetition. It's not knowing, it's doing. Everyone reads a book about EQ and they think they know what it is. And they do. They just can't apply it because it's hard. Right? What's interesting is some of the smartest people I know have some of the worst emotional intelligence that I've, of anyone I've run into. <laughs> well, think about it. How do you get smart IQ? It's not being with other people. It's being by yourself, programming, reading, studying. And how do you develop social skills? You know, when I was an engineer... You know, it would be go three or four days before I talked to somebody and I'd open my mouth and it it was like a little bit of learning curve there (laughs) because there's no interaction, your, your head. And it was great. You're in the zone, you're in the flow, but to connect with another human being requires you like, what are they going through right now? Right? Like when they're getting cut off in traffic, they didn't plan that. Maybe, maybe they're going to the hospital to see a dying parent. Maybe mm-hmm. something just bad happened to them and they didn't have the consideration to put their blinker on. And what is the best way for a salesperson to train their mind to react in the moment with emotional intelligence, to, to have their go-to thought after someone cuts them off being like, oh, they're probably really distracted and stressed out and that's why they're a terrible driver. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, how do you how do you get how do you train your mind to do that instead of like shaking your fist and, and yelling at your windshield? Yeah. You kind of have to like future pace it. It's like if you future pace somebody, hang up on you to say, "No problem, next one." Now, I don't what, know what does that mean? Future pace. Future pace. Anticipate it. Okay. Anticipate. So no, knowing that it can happen means that when it does happen, it doesn't bother you. Right. Give it a different meaning. Okay. You know, because I post a lot on social and you get all kinds of people hating it, misinterpreting it, uh, spamming, promoting their own stuff, hijacking the post. Mm -hmm. And if you use your mammal brain, you're going to get kicked off LinkedIn. (laughs) 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 Because if you say it was really feeling... (laughs) most people uh, watch these, most people listen to these podcasts on, on like podcast platforms, but we also put them on, on YouTube. And someone like in the comments section was like, 
making fun of me for being pasty and not tan. And I was like, oh, man, come on. <laughs> like, oh, that's the nicest things about, I've heard. <laughs> just teaching you about sales over here. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> and, but that shows you about that unconscious mammal brain because they're not listening to the podcast, hearing what's being said, internalizing what does it mean, how can I use it. They're reacting to the image, what you're wearing, uh, the background, uh, whatever, whatever they, they want to hate on or the, the immediate impulse. I just put one about selling a pen. Of course, the immediate impact for most people was Wolf of Wall Street. And I go, okay, the video has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> But it was like it was, a good, it was a classic thing to say before they said it in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> right. It was more like, how do you use it during an interview if you get the question to get the other person to tell you what they really want to hear from you and then get the offer. But, you know, people didn't watch the video. They read the title and they just have a knee jerk reaction. You know, and, and this is what happens to us. You know, it, we, we don't think we react so you got to anticipate how someone going to react to this not think about it they're not going to really contemplate your pitch so that's why you got to get them talking you know talking well, about the this, symptoms this, it makes me think of objections and objection handling what would you recommend how does ei relate to objections and objection handling well you, you can only Assuming get an objection if you're proposing something Mm -hmm. If you're asking, right, like, what do you care about? What are you up against? Uh, how do you feel when this happens? You ever notice this? What we hear is this. And you get them talking. You don't ask for 15 minutes of their time, right? You don't ask for a demo. Are, Any interest in seeing this? Right? They're not going to say it's too much. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so it, only in the rare case where they just want to get rid of you completely, they say, I got no budget, right? It's just like, I don't want to hear anything from anybody. Okay. But you, you got to start where they are. And most likely they're unaware of the problem that you solve. So you got to start there and build awareness about the problem by developing symptoms of what, that are affected by the problem. And then all of a sudden now they're open to it. And they go, have you ever looked at alternatives to solve this? Are you curious about what's out there? And kind of build this rapport. And when I say rapport, it's not about talking about the fish on the wall. It's, it's starting where they are with questions and curiosity and interest about what they're up against. And how about the other way when something's not going well? How do you know when to walk away from a deal? Does, does EI give you can, you, can you put yourself in the other person's shoes and be in touch with your emotions to get better signals on yeah. when something's yeah. just worth walking from? Absolutely, because people don't like to give bad news, right? When, when you're, you know, if you're not going to hire somebody, just say we put that role on hold. When you're pitching an investor, they go, well, come back to us in three months and give us an update. They don't say no, right? But they are saying no. <laughs> They're not giving you money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, it's a definite maybe, which is a no today. <laughs> and it takes emotional intelligence to read that. Like, is this person not lying, but not completely accurate information? It's like the no decision. Yeah, there is a decision. You're not getting an order. That's a decision. Go down to the bank with the no decision and see what you can get. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Have to deposit that. Yeah, no decision. <laughs> and and we don't want to hear it either. Right. We right. don't. Um, yes. Yeah, so if you're listening, to, if you're listening to the emotions, you can be better tuned in and know when to walk because they might not just tell you with. They might not tell your logical brain, but they, they've already told your, your, your mammal brain. Right. If they're unwilling to have a, you know, a follow-up call in two weeks for five minutes, 
and they say, oh, we're, we're busy, I'll get back to you, that means they're not interested. You know, and we, you always use like dating as a great analogy. You know, if somebody's washing sure. their hair on Saturday night, it, it, she's just not that into you. If I, mean, you, I, have to spend, I have to spend a lot of time on my hair. I mean, it's, it's Saturday. I, it's you know, time consuming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, by the end of the day. You, know, you got to work on the skin, though. Right? You're going to get the tanner. Yeah. Mm -hmm, that's right. I'm working on both of those things, you know, given the feedback of my, my YouTube detractors. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so, so how do you, uh, how about building trust? How can you better use emotional intelligence. I was, I was in my Spain office and I had an employee from our Philippines office in, and they were staying at my place in San Francisco because I was gone for, you know, three weeks to, to Europe. And, uh, and literally the sink exploded. Like the, they did their laundry or something. I'm not even sure. How, it might've just been a backup from the street. I'm not sure how it happened, but like the sink in the laundry room just like flooded the whole, uh, the whole area. So I, I was just lucky someone was staying there when, uh, when this, because I, I would have come back three weeks later and the whole house would have been rotten. In water. And that's it. And that's a, as salespeople, we do almost everything to break trust. We push, um, we, we focus on what we need, the timings about our priorities, not theirs. We don't ask questions. We don't offer help. We only want updates. And yeah. what I hear quite often from managers is my reps don't seem to care. And it's like, well, you're probably putting them through this cadence where they don't have time to care. And people sense it. Yeah. I, I, uh, one of, one of my tricks to have when, when I was a rep, one of the reasons I was successful was because my, my managers, because I was already selling a lot, weren't, holding a gun to my head, telling me to drag crazy deals in this quarter at the end of the quarter to like make my number. And so I was able to close them on their natural timeline, which might've been two months later. It might've been five months later, but by letting it close in its natural timeline, I was able to close it for much more money. And I didn't have to like, you know, do crazy giveaways to drag it, to, to drag it into the quarter. And, and it's so like, it's like I stayed ahead because I was ahead, you know? Yeah. And you're right. And you communicate with the people you help them, you answer their questions, you get them support, you show them what the product can really do. And you're passionate about helping them be more successful at their job. And that comes across instead of like, Absolutely. let me show you all hundred features. It'll only be three hours. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to love it. Um, <laughs> get some popcorn. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, uh, we, I, I advise to everyone to get a great, have the, one of your best reps at demoing, do a great demo video, record it, edit, edit it, like make it super, super tight, have it scripted and put that on your website because it's better than any, it's, it's, it's great for people to be able to get a demo you know, before they get on the phone with, with one of your reps. It just saves the rep time, saves, saves the, the customer time. And it's, I think it comes from a place of empathizing with the customer that like, they want just like a succinct answer and a succinct when they, when they ask themselves, what's this product look like? It'd be, it's great to get like a succinct, awesome tight demo that they can just like jump online on their, on their phone whenever, you know, when they're sitting on the train or whatever and, and see the basics of rather than having to go through all the rigmarole. If they've got more questions, then, then it's time to go deeper. But That's it. And if you can ask yourself, how do I demonstrate I have their interests in mind above mine? And, and yeah. when you break that, you can't, re it's very hard to repair. So the next section is sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers. First question is, what is the one question you should ask all your prospects? Oh, now, what do they care about most? What's important to them? What are they up against? You know, something around the problem that you solve, not the product you sell. You know, yeah. How that do you was do it lesson today? number one. And that was lesson number one in IBM sales training that I went through in, what was that, 2000, 
seven. <laughs> Everybody um, talks about the product, the company, them. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about, you know, what is the problem that you solve? Sell that. Then the product becomes easy. Yeah. Now, other than that skill, what, what is something that differentiates a good salesperson from a great salesperson? A great salesperson can anticipate what's going to happen so that they can prevent the deal from getting stuck because deals have a certain pattern, especially large complex deals. Everything's nice and rosy until they have to get it through the system. Having it being identified as something that they want to buy, that's the easy part. Even the money isn't that hard. It's the politics and the administration that get stuck. And it usually dies uh, one of three ways. You know, some mysterious person has to be involved that no one ever heard of, advisory board, board of directors, specialists, standards committee, all of a sudden pops up. And all of a sudden, now you have to start the deal over with them. Or they, they go from an enterprise license to a single seat license. <laughs> right? So you just spent six months to get a tiny deal. Or they just decided to back burner it. It's just too hard to get it done. And it's like, uh, we'll look at it next quarter. So all of these things are going to happen. So it's up to us to keep the direction and momentum and control of the deal moving straight forward. Yeah, I was, I was uh, selling one of the biggest deals of my life um, to a big pharmaceutical company, one of the major, you know, one of the big five pharma companies. And it, me and my, and one of my engineers in, in the room, um, you know, talking, talking about how Badger would, would help their, them sell more and organize their sales force, yada, yada, yada. And they, they, like the 17 executives seem to all be on board with the concept that we would be extremely helpful to their organization. And like all, all of our value propositions were like checking the boxes for them. But what they did, what, what no one could agree on was whose department and which part of the organization would run this slash get the credit slash like control it slash who owns the, you know, all the, it was all just their internal bickering and yes. like, and, and literally the whole, it was like a three hour meeting and probably 20 minutes of it was about us. The rest was just like them and their internal morass that they had to, <laughs> they had to wade through and they did not end up doing anything. They were just, you know, they were, it was, well, it looks like we're gonna have to have another meeting to try to figure out who, you know, they just, it just slid sideways and there was nothing. Right. We tried to get the, keep the thing on track and, but no, it, it, that did not work. And, and that's not the exception. That's kind of the rule in certain size deals which typically you're doing a big deal with a big company and mm -hmm. nobody goes to decision-making school inside that company, nor how to automate the company or how to spend the company's money. That's right. orthogonal. They teach you how not to spend the company's money. <laughs> well, it's, you know, and it's funny, it wasn't even about the money. Like it no. wasn't about the value they would receive and it wasn't about the cost. It was pure. I mean, they're a pharma company. They, they, print money, right? They sell little bits of chemicals and expensive pill bottles, but they, they, it was just like politics almost. It was like, it is politics. Know, it, was, it was the IT department versus the sales operations department versus the, the, the sales management department, you know, like it was right. It Who's was, going to run you know, training? Who's going to support it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to administrate the updates? Who's going to, yeah. all these little nits. And these yeah. people who their whole job is to cover that one little piece and fight for their little fiefdom. Either they want it or they don't want it. That responsibility, <laughs> not the product. I, I used to, uh, when I was at Google, one of the products I sold was, was Google Apps. And uh, so very commonly we were replacing like Lotus Notes installations with Gmail. And, you know, Lotus is historically not the best email program, obviously. It's it's all you know, Microsoft, Microsoft and, and Google at this point. But... Um, there was always like, you know, it, if we're replacing a Lotus deal, there's, there's some Lotus notes administrator whose title is literally something like Lotus notes administrator. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like that person's in the room and I'm at the front being like, and you're going to save a ton of money by getting right. rid of Lotus notes. Like, <laughs> this <you know>? guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's like, do I want to learn something new? No. <laughs> yeah. The class, it's all, it's going to happen. Yeah. All that stuff that you're like, you know, don't you need it anymore. Work, <laughs> yeah. You got to work to keep all those servers standing. They fall over their emails out for three days. No longer Google's servers don't fall over. We, you know, it's all mirrored and backed up and you know, don't have to, don't have to spend any time on that. That guy did not like that. He was like, well, <laughs> right. Yeah. Because change helps some people hurt some people, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And if you're not, un- so, oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and if you're unaware of that, you're just smiling. The ROI makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, they're going to do it. Yeah, why wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Lotus Notes guy has a reason. Trust me. So that, that's yeah. something we have to think about as salespeople for right. sure. And, and if you're and, up in the seven figures, it goes to the board. And if you don't, if you have like the chairman or a board member is on the board of a competitor, guess what's going to happen? They're going to like, did you Absolutely. look at us? You got to take a second look. <laughs> they call the CEO. Yeah. He goes, what? We're losing? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And what, what about listening? What, what makes a salesperson a good listener? If you're asking yourself, what's the meaning behind the words? instead of the words. People can hear the words, but what's the meaning? And, uh, and th- this is what like the AI conversational intelligence people don't get, is that they just follow the words. It's not the pauses between the words, it's not which words, and, and uh, which words show understanding versus confusion, which words show caution versus enthusiasm. Uh, well, they also, I think this is something that we miss in general as salespeople. We're not able to get face to face with someone. There's so much of communication isn't even just in the oh, words. Language. It's in the way their eye, the way someone's eye looks or how they look at the, how they look at the other guy when you say the price or how, you know, like all these well, things. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big I, I, mystery I, fan. And there's a, a, do, a documentary on Showtime now called Outcry. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this guy who's going to prison for 25 years. And I go, maybe I'm crazy, but I don't think he's lying. Yeah. And we have intuition around these things, right? We really, we have, we, I call it a bullshit meter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Because when your salary or your income is based off of the truth that the other person, your decisions are based off of what they're telling you. And you're like, Mm -hmm. ah, and you get this, you know, you hear like a person on the first meeting talk about an enterprise deal. And you're like, ah, that's a little premature for that. <laughs> there should be a lot of push before that com- word comes up. Yeah, it can be, it can, it, it's, it, it's, all, I feel like it's so much harder to do. And you, you can even do it just seeing someone on a TV, like you're saying, it, being in a room and seeing the dynamics, I, 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 I uh, I'm not, I'm not doing a good job of my sales in 60 seconds rules here, but I've got a quick story on this. Like, <laughs> the, I, was, I was doing like a, it was, a, I think it was a $1.3 million deal. Um, and I was, I was selling Google maps at the time. And uh, so the Google maps API and um, this, this company, big tech company, and they, they had about 17 installations of Google across their organization, and uh, and they they had just decided that they uh, Google had decided it was going to start charging everyone uh, if a if a company was using like Google in a lot of places, then it was going to put them over, and they couldn't use the free. They they had to start paying for it, and that this is like a policy change, right? So basically, these guys had always had this for free, and I was going and they're saying, "Yeah, you you owe me one point five million dollars." ended up being 1.3, but, um, but the, uh, but I, like my, I, I was there with my manager at the time and I remember, I remember him being like, um, like they, they're, they're, they were basically telling us we're going to rip you, rip, rip this all out of here. We're going to use this other product instead. You know, this is, this is total BS that you guys are, are trying to charge us for this. We've always used it for you. You know, we're huge customers of you on, you know, your actual business over here, the ad side, like, we are, we're going to rip this out all that we're, you know, we can't pay for this. We didn't plan for this. We had no budget for it. And, and we, and, and I saw one of the product engineers 
look at one of the, there were like probably 15 people in the meeting and, and I saw one of the product engineers look at one of the other product engineers and like not roll his eyes, but like when, when the guy was like, we're going to rip this all out of here. He was like, looked at his buddy. He was like, yeah, we are like, and I knew we are. I was like, Oh no, you guys are paying us. There is no way. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I saw a look on the engineer's face. Like, yeah, we're going to replace that 17 times. It, right. did, did you give me a team of six guys to do that for the next year? Cause <laughs> because and, you, you're, you're looking for the tells from the other people. Yeah. But and, I, had, I had to be in the room for that one. <laughs> and that's it. Because if you listen to just the words, you'd be like, okay, but how about 600 K? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's exactly my, 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 my manager and I went out to the parking lot and he was like, we should, we should just drop our pants on this. We should, uh, we should give it to him for like 200 K or something, take the money off the table. And I was like, let me, let me negotiate this out. Give me, give me a couple months. Let me do this. And, uh, and that, you know, that was, that was the difference between a, a good year and a great year for me, right? It was a big, yeah. it's a big spread, extra million bucks. Right. Because you knew the reality. Yeah. You know, and if you watch these and, murder and, shows, you can just see. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, most people, people aren't great liars, right? Most, people are terrible <laughs> liars. <laughs> you, people, people are, yeah, they're not good at it. So, you know, if you, if you, especially if you have had a career in sales, you often have, gut instincts about is this person BSing me or is this is, is this in the level? Um so what is your top tip for being empathetic and thinking like a prospect? How do you what would you say what would you tell a rep that that is trying to just get started in their their empathy training? The first is to start being curious. Ask yourself what don't I know? Because no matter how much we know, we're, it's still incomplete, right? Even twins can't read each other's minds. What don't right. I know about this account? If you start asking yourself those questions, you'll naturally become more curious. What do I wish I knew? What question would help me answer that without being too overt? Curiosity is the key to empathy. That that might that might be the headline of this show. <laughs> it is. I love it. Well, I'm going to attempt to uh, summarize everything that we've talked about today. Um, no promises that I get all the important stuff, but I'll I'll try to run through it in two minutes here. Um, so first, it's it's really important to have an outward mindset and to know both your customer and yourself. No. Yeah. The ability to connect with another human being is not necessarily something we're born with. It's something we learn. It's something we're socialized into. It's important to show your prospects that you're curious about them and you, it's important that you connect with them over something that they care about. So this outward mindset is it, it's all about taking a step back and taking the time to learn about what your customers days are like and understand what their needs are. Be really thoughtful about what will help your prospects and meet them where they are. Get an inside view into your prospects' problems and motivations by talking with someone that you know uh, in your company or a friend or a, someone in your network that fits the persona of your ideal prospects and ask them what their interests are, what motivates them, what problems they face, what they're scared of. Uh, know your customer as well as you know yourself or better. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the way you can start walking around in their shoes. Um, EI or EQ, um, emotional intelligence is hard because it takes continuous effort and repetition. Get your prospects talking about the different issues they're facing and listen to their emotions. So that way you can understand what their symptoms are of their problem and, and you can start to develop rapport by empath empathizing with those, with those problems and, and the symptoms of those problems. You have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> I take notes. <laughs> I actually have a terrible memory. <laughs> but uh, so uh, build trust with prospects by showing them that you'd put their interests above 
your own interests. This has been fantastic, Brian. I mean, this is such powerful stuff. And I, I think the, all the great salespeople do this, even if they're not even conscious of it. They're just, you know, they, they just were taught to be empathetic at a young age. And now, now it's just a muscle. They, they, they flex and, and don't even realize it. But um, what, what you're saying is so important. Where, where can listeners read more about your work and how can they reach out to you? How do they learn more of what you teach? Um, I'm super active on LinkedIn, Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn, and check out the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming in today, Brian. Uh, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from polishing up on their emotional intelligence skills, uh, share this podcast with them. Um, Take care until next, next time, everybody. And thanks a lot for coming in, Brian. If you look at skill set, nobody talks about the outward mindset. You know, people pick apart the elements, but no one's putting it together. Uh, so I'm going to start working on this. It's already in uh, pretty much both of the courses where we dissect each persona and so that you can understand it and visualize it. Because without it, we're blinded by our own needs. Uh, in, in my first book, I talk about this, is that law number one, people will do what's their, in their own best interest. Now, this is obvious to people, but we're blinded by our own best interest. So we can't see what the other person's best interest is. And what I, I tend to see epiphanies with people is uh, either they're maybe the oldest child where they're responsible for taking care of their brothers and sisters, or they've taken care of a pet where they've had to learn uh, how another creature uh, thinks and needs, feeding, cleaning, uh, caring for something else. And it's not so much just putting that person's interest uh, above yours. It's not. It's, it's considering them so that you can understand why other people do what they do and to start where they are versus starting where we are. All the stuff I see on the internet, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever about sales always starts where the rep is talking about the product. Some talk about the problems it solve. But what we have to do is get into the head of the other person and start where they are. Are they in market? Great. Start with the product and the problem and you'll have some success. But most of us are not in market for what the other person is selling. So where are we? Uh, we don't care. Not only do we not care, we're annoyed by that person talking about that problem. I don't feel that pain. In the courses, I teach you how to work around that, how to build it up. It's not about coming up with a better pitch. It's about using the outward mindset to connect with another human being and start where they are and build up to where you want them to be. And this is how conversation has always worked and how smart people have always done it. But it takes a little bit of forethought. It takes a little bit of understanding and it takes a lot of practice to internalize and develop it. It's not a script. It is a process, but the words need to be your own. They need to be specific to your market, the person you're talking to, and you have to develop this sense of where the other person is and understand how they are interpreting these words. The, I, I think the outward mindset above all others is key to becoming great at sales. You can become okay at sales, you know, playing the numbers game and working your butt off. I've seen people, you know, become good B players doing that, but you wear out because you're a carbon form. <laughs> meaning you're a human being and uh, you tend to get beaten down. So if you're looking for a smarter way, a more effective way of doing this, 
Go to b2brevenue.com and don't view it as a course. View it as a year-long personal development process because you're not alone. It's not just me talking about slides. It's lessons, applying the lessons step-by-step, hearing how other people are doing it. You get community with office hours and one-on-ones. Office hours are an hour meetup every other week where it's topic-based discussion, Q&A, and you get to hear how other people are applying the principles of the course into their particular market. And on an office hours just a couple of weeks ago, somebody was applying it to one of the students and the student goes, you know what, Brian, it worked on me. And I now see the difference. So these epiphanies that we all need to take and have and practice. So look at it as a year of development. To be able to start conversations with complete strangers is a talent and a skill. It's not a quiz. But once you have it, once you've developed it, once you've built upon it, you can turn it into a system. You can break it down into bite-sized pieces. You can automate it with technology, augment it with virtual assistants. And I show people how to do that so that you can scale it. I've scaled it. I've got a machine going right now that uh, I've made it so simple that I outsource it to very inexpensive people so it can scale, and I, I leverage technology as well. The other part is closing the complex sale. No one teaches this stuff. You, you need probably 10, 15 years of just you know, head-butting experience working on complex sales especially in the hardest of the hard. These are not complex sales where you're the incumbent and you're just trying to get a bigger deal. Or you got a big brand name and you're just globbing something onto a, a, you know, an annual contract. These are your, you're the underdog. You're trying to sell something new, something hard. Nobody joins these courses where their, their job is easy. They join these courses because their job is hard and you get to hear it you know, because we've been doing this for a couple of years, deals from beginning to end, the lessons along the way, putting yourself in that person's place is just invaluable because it's not just learning a lesson. You know, in the past, I've had people take the course. Oh, I know it. I took it. Okay. How how you do? Well, yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay. How's it working? Uh, They don't want to apply it. They just want to feel comfortable that they know it. It's not a book. You know, people pick up books, and there are some great books that should be, you know, on your shelf, in your bag all the time because the lessons take a long time to develop. They're habits. They're skill sets. And they do not just happen. So come back for part two of the Outward Mindset. I might drop it this week or I might uh, spread it out a little bit so that you get a little variety. And let me know what you think about this. Uh, If you see me on LinkedIn, give a little thumbs up, a little comment, a little share to the content. If you're a YouTuber, go to YouTube. Just search Brian Burns Sales on YouTube and it'll all come up if you're a visual person. We'll see you next time.